So you, you started in multifamily, same as us. I think a lot of people start in that asset class because it's the most common, right? Um, but like what, as you were looking into like, hey, what asset class am I going into next? You landed on the, on the RV parks. Like what brought you to that direction? Why do you think it's the best asset class to be investing in? What's, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think it started with mobile home parks and then, and then RV parks. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Uh, the, the MH was definitely the start and then it transformed into RV after. But yeah, multifamily was a start. And, um, I, you know, I, I am definitely a believer in falling in love with the return profile more than falling in love with the asset class. And it's something that, you know, curses me sometimes because, you know, you, you get frustrated when you start seeing, you know, the return profile is you know, shifting, um, mm. which, you know, is this natural part of you know these, these cycles. But, um, you know, I think with multifamily, I, I think getting in, you know, initially I was uh, eager to target, you know, 8% plus yield. And, uh, you know, I, I, I like the idea of having just the margin of safety that you have. Uh, you know, when you have a higher yield asset that still has value add potential and, you know, there's a lot, I think a lot of our strategy early on was, was targeting mom and pops. And, uh, you know, then, then I think, uh, that became a little bit more difficult to find. It definitely still exists. And, uh, you know, we, we still have some multi that we bought in the last few years, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think, uh, for me, the, my, my appetite for the returns that were presented in the MH in space and then you know um shortly after you know the rv space uh yeah just to me it just made more sense i don't know if i'm just you know i guess i'm just you, you consider me more of like a cash flow driven investor in, in some regards but um you know i think one i i, I def, definitely just get generally attracted to higher yield i think it you know i think having a healthier debt coverage ratio there's something to be said about it i think it's more resistant towards what we're going through right now with the uh you know interest rate uh, interest rates shooting up, um, doesn't have nearly the, the downside impact that you do there. And I like that, you know, most of the space uses more conservative leverage of, you know, mostly fixed rate, uh, you know, five-year loans, there's not as much bridge that you're competing up against. So, uh, you know, I think, I think it was a variety of, of, of those things that got me interested. And then, you know, at the same time, you always have to look at the underlying risk because it's not just about the potential yield, but, you know, in, in this case, like, uh, both asset classes have, you know, very to show really consistent growth over a long spans of time and uh, low overall capex risk, which is nice in the sense that you don't have like too much money constantly needed for uh, just deferred maintenance issues that can take place in the properties. And um, in addition to that, uh, yeah, I think they they both just show a lot of resilience with just uh, you know strong uh, you know occupancy levels and and uh, in, in the MH space very very long term uh, residents and in the RV space just uh, you know a lot of uh, strong repeat customers. Are you seeing a lot of um, institutional investors coming into the mobile home park space now too? Crazy amounts. Yeah, it's it's changed dramatically since so since I, even since I started uh, three years ago. Um, you know, cap rates have went down to where right now they're lower than multifamily in quite a few markets. It's not the cash cow that it was. Uh, so so it's certainly been more difficult because institutions have definitely woken up to it, and you're seeing you know a lot of people exiting in portfolio sales to these institutions. So uh, we've seen tremendous cap rate compression. Um, it's been in the last eighteen. 12 to 18 months, it's been really difficult. We've only closed on one MH deal. We've been a lot more active within within campgrounds as a result of it. Um, but I would say that more recently, knock on wood, but I, I, we, we are starting to get a little bit closer on some deals that are that are making a little bit more sense to us now. So, um, you know, ho hopefully uh, there's some price adjustment. There hasn't been, I, I think in MH, there's been less price adjustment than most of their asset classes. But I do feel like, uh, you know, there, there is a little bit of adjustment going on right now, which is, uh, you know, starting to help us make a little bit better sense of things. And so uh, within, within when you go, so I guess for one of the things on this show that I get some feedback on a lot is we, we start, and it, it's easy to do, especially talking to someone like yourself, very sophisticated, knowledgeable, intelligent investor. Uh, we start to talk, you know, pretty in depth about, commercial real estate and syndications and different asset classes. But if we break it down at a more fundamental level, I mean, I think you're saying that mobile home parks, you like the macroeconomic trends, uh, occupancy rates. I mean, housing costs are through the roof for everybody, right? Kind of drives more people into uh, the mobile home park space, especially if you have a park that uh, that you can go in and add a ton of value to. And it's not like... Um, 
like uh, if you guys ever watched Trailer Park Boys, right? Like you find a find a show like that. That's not what Dylan has, but <laughs> you know, if you or you find a, a a you know something in a in an area that is the population's growing, um, and maybe it's just been you know neglected. It's a mom and pop shop, and then you come in and and you enact your value add strategy to make it beautiful and um and, and desirable to live in and it's it's a lot more cost effective than going out and, and buying a buying a house or it's so it's easy easy to downsize in is is that some of the things that you're talking through yeah for sure i mean on the mh side of things uh generally there, it's not even just an alternative to an apartment it's usually an alternative to a house for most of these people and uh, most most uh residents are you know people with families they want to, they, they don't want shared walls they want uh you know front and backyard their kids can play in and uh, you know, the, they generally are looking for longer term home ownership, but maybe they just don't have the credit or the down payment uh, to be able to get into uh, traditional residential homes. So uh, oftentimes this just makes one of the most affordable forms of home ownership where, you know, they can buy a used home for 10 to 20,000 or they can buy a new home for you know, 65,000 or something along those lines with the financing program. Um, and then from there, they're just really responsible for lot rent. And, and you know, that takes care of a lot of times either they're utilities or the upkeep of the community and, and, uh, you know, lawn care oftentimes, and, and also just the uh, professional management, right. Uh, people making sure that they're living in a, you know, safe, uh, safe place they can call home. So, uh, the average, given that, you know, the nature of that, um, and the fact that they own a home means that, you know, their, their monthly bill is, you know, usually, uh, about 50%, you know, 40 to 50% of what a one bedroom apartment rental would would cost and these are you know two to three bedroom homes so so they have you know substantially uh it's it, you know, substantially better than uh you know, renting uh you know apartment would be for them for most people in this situation and um it uh that because of that they they generally have a vested interest in taking care of their home being a part of the community and and that's usually why they, they stay for an average of 15 to 20 years after uh, purchasing a home, so you, you know, for the ownership, you don't have nearly as much leasing and turnover that you you deal with, which is a huge cost. I mean, mm -hmm. unit turns in multifamily, that's um, you know that that's a huge benefit. Yeah, I know when I talk to you, I get excited about this asset class too. Were you gonna ask? Well, I was I was just gonna say like a, something I was thinking about was when there's so many ways to make money in real estate, right? Like you can hundreds of ways out, maybe even thousands of ways, where there's a lot of ways that you can go on real estate. And I think when someone's starting off trying to figure out which path do I go down, it can be pretty daunting, right? Like, should I get an Airbnb? Should I get into flipping, wholesaling? Should I get syndication, right? I think it really makes sense to, as, as we, you know, in our business, we've been in multiple asset classes. As Dylan's talking about, he's been in several asset classes. It's, I think it makes most sense. You start in one, right? Like become strong in one asset class, do a few deals there. And then you might find, okay, no, I like this asset class better. And you go over to this asset class and maybe a couple of years later, you go over to this one. But I think it's, you certainly want to start in one asset class and just do that one for a little bit of time. At least I think that makes the most you sense. You want to know what you're looking for, I think, right? So if you're just like, hey, I'm out here looking for a deal, right? Like, you know, yeah. it's, it's a lot harder to find something rather than essentially knowing exactly, you know, what's going to fit into your model and what, you know, um, what you what you can get most excited about, I think, uh, to use your term, Dylan, and then um, and then basically getting out and meeting with uh, one one thing that I thought was interesting, um, and I know you guys do this, but uh, but on your website, I think I've said ninety percent off market deals. So how do you guys go about finding off market deals? Like, what is your do you have any strategies or systems processes in place? Yeah, so. Uh, let's put a tweet out about the, this this morning. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention kind of some of the, the stats that I hit on here. But the uh, when it comes to the off market deals, the, we do a lot of cold calling. We make at least a hundred calls a day, uh, you know, five days a week, and generally that results in about one to two appointments per weekday with owners across the country. Uh, so we we generally are you know looking for people that have, you know, they kind of fit our buy box and we build a list of, of these owners and we try to maintain a uh, good follow-up uh, with them. But that said, though 90% of our deals are off-market, uh, the majority of the off-market deals have been off-market through brokers. Um, there are just so many great brokers out there and uh, it's inevitable that they make so many calls a day too. They're probably all making 100 calls a day each too. 
Uh, so it's a lot of brokers and other owners that are doing the same thing that we do, um, calling different ownership groups and then referring it to us off market, right? So that's that's actually where the the bulk of our off market deals have come from. Though our direct marketing is is a huge priority for us, and we found some tremendous deals there. Um, the uh, bulk is through brokers. So the, the stats that I was uh, referencing earlier was, uh, you know, it looks like our on market deal. We've only done four on market deals. Uh, you know, throughout the, I've only done four in the last six years, I guess I should say, out of doing like 26 transactions or something like that. Four of the 26 have been been on the market. Um, and I would say we, if I had to guesstimate, we probably are, we probably, we underwrite a ton of deals. So we probably underwrite, probably one deal for every 200 that we underwrite ends up getting somewhere for the on-market deals. So you would question, is it even worth your time or why do you even look at on-market deals anymore if, you know, you, if you, your conversion rate is 200 to one when, our off-market conversion rate is probably 50 to 1. Um, but the reason is, is because just by keeping active, working with the brokers and showing that we're you know, an active buyer and we're, we're giving them feedback on the on-market stuff, uh, that usually opens up doors for them to, to think of us, you know, first in mind. So when they go to shop something off-market, you know, we come to mind and they can, you know, they, we have the reputation with them where they're, they know that we're serious buyers and ready to close when the very opportunity comes. I agree with all that. Yeah. So let's let's go back a little bit. I know we're jumping around a bit, but so what? One thing that that is super interesting to me is just the value add strategies throughout different asset classes. And so um, within mobile home parks, like when you guys identify a park that you that you like, uh, or or the RV campgrounds, and I and I'm sure they're similar, but um, you know, I'd love to understand kind of what what are the like the top things you hit on to really, you know, um, change, you know, the, the look and feel the brand and ultimately the, uh, the net operating income and, and cash flow of the properties. Like what do you, what's your, yeah, I'll, I'll hit on both of them in a nutshell. Cause they, they actually can be a, a quite a bit different at, uh, as you get into it, but the, uh, the MH communities that we serve, uh, again, these are, these are residents and are oftentimes they, they're not getting treated with the you know, level of, uh, quality professionalism, service, and care that you know you might see in uh, you know even a B or C class apartment, right, with a professional management company in place. So uh, you're dealing with people that you know have been dealing with a lot of have mom and pop ownership groups, and some of them are great, of course, but then some of them we've seen just like some people being like severely mistreated, uh, or you know they're they're not screening their tenant, they're not screening any of their prospective tenants, so like they're having people that you know have. Uh, bad records moving into their backyards or you know, drug dealers in the communities and things along those lines, right? So I think the, the main way that we add value in those sort of communities is we bring in the professional systems. We start, you know, make sure people feel heard, they feel listened to, you know, they're, they're, the proper renovations are given to the homes that we we would own in the community if we own some of the homes. And uh, then we we help with uh, non-renewing or, you know, evicting any, anyone that is not up to the the standard of living that we're we're shooting for um making it you know all around a safer place you know oftentimes we also pave the roads if they're not already paved we try to add lighting um things along those lines right we, we try to do events like back to school events where we give out school supplies and different you know holiday events throughout the year and uh you know i think uh, it's more of the sense of community that we try to we try to bring in it's probably the number one uh value add uh, across the board for the mh world now, on the RV side of things, RV pr- presents a little bit more of a hospitality business uh, without getting too into it. Uh, but, you know, you have some that treat this, their RV like a second home. And then you also have some that are just visiting for short-term stays. And we do have you know, some that, of course, live in their RV full-time, which is becoming more and more popular. Um, but it is, generally speaking, a, more of a hospitality geared uh, business. So uh, you, you, oftentimes, one of the big value adds uh, from an ownership perspective is just bringing them online if they might not have a website or it might be a really old website with you know clip art from like 1990s on the homepage. so by, by us being able to go in and put you know more modern website in place get online booking in place and um, also running google and facebook ads and different you know seo uh, campaigns to be able to you know build up the online presence and you know build up the stronger facebook page and I think our, our team does a lot of TikToks and things like that now to get the word out. Um, you know, I think it, it really helps with just developing like the branding and the marketing needed to to be able to get the word out for the campground itself. 
Um, then past that, it's the you know the guest events doing uh, you know, at least one event per month, but some are much more frequent than that. Uh, you know, on the campgrounds, so holding guest events, especially if you're buying off a you know campground owner that's a little bit burnt out after you know decades of running the place, they might have stopped doing events and stopped you know trying to pour in for the community. So we come in and help reinvigorate it with more events. We bring in you know a pretty healthy. Uh, improvement budget usually to help with like adding uh, you know more amenities for people like uh, we've done gem mining we've done mini golf we've we've done uh, upgraded you know the pool areas we've got we're adding a sports lounge to one we have arcades in a bunch we have uh, uh, you know, kayak rentals um, dog parks uh, you know uh, it's all about just pouring in and you know creating you know nice things for people to do while they're there creating memories. Uh, for for the time that they're there, so uh, yeah, you you can start to see how yeah it ends up being a little bit of a different business in that sense in terms of the the overall value add strategy. Um, but you know that's that's definitely a big thing is trying to just really push create great experiences, try to push for lots of five star reviews, and uh, you know just build up the uh, reputation uh, online for each of these uh, companies. I love it. What questions you got about RV parks? I'm getting I'm I want to start looking for these things now. Yeah, I mean, I, I keep hearing more and more great things about the space. I mean, it's one of the asset classes we haven't really uh, explored or done yet. But like, like I was going back to though too, it's also like it's easy to get the shiny with any business, yeah. right? The shiny object For stuff, sure. where it's like, oh, different real estate asset class or crypto or NFTs. It's like very easy to yeah get. So it's like I, I do think there's something to be said about like, all right, just well, stay in your lane yeah. and like focus on. what Yeah, you're we doing. just don't have the the. I mean, we don't have a team or anything in place to be able to go and, and, and have that sort of hospitality mindset. But that's so cool. And, you know, as as you think about, like, everything coming online these days and, you just, I mean, find these parks that have, you know, a super outdated website and they're not doing, like, fun events and stuff. It's it's like taking the Airbnb model and, make, and, and doing it at scale. And uh, I love it, man. So, so, but it's well, it's much easier than Airbnb. I'll admit that, you know, and and I'm not saying it's easy because it is a lot of hard work. I've talked to plenty of people that have gotten into a campground and dreaded it because of how much work it ended up being. So, like, I mean, we we've been fortunate to have a good team, but uh, I, I still think it's admittedly easier than Airbnb. We have uh, about 40 short-term rentals scattered throughout our portfolio, so we have a ton of experience with it. Um, but you know, just taking just the fact that you're taking out the cleaner aspect and having to manage all the cleaners and deal with you know uh all the you know deferred maintenance like leaks and all kinds of stuff that takes place you know when you have the physical structure um i've personally found it to be much easier in that sense and uh even like just staying competitive on airbnb listings is, is a lot of work I and mean, it can be it can be tough so like i i definitely come to the conclusion that i prefer the the short-term rental aspect of rvs over uh you know your typical str model uh today such a cool niche.